Now, since then, this this is basically a family history to allow my descendants, notice the word descendants, with my wife, some information about their ancestors. So the word ancestors that means people that have lived before and are now dead. So as I mentioned before, I'm 80 years old, so I'm probably soon going to become an ancestor. Yeah, look at the camera. Again? Talk, looking at the camera. Okay, for, scrap the rest it's and okay. I look at the camera. It's okay, no problem. Let's go ahead. And so, I'll start then with birth. Because a human being is basically born to other human beings as a baby. And in biology, you're either male or female. So obviously, if you look at my face, I have hair on my face. So I'm a man because women do not have hair on their faces. And so if you look at my, my head, I still have hair on my head. And this is sort of like a joke because many people my age Many people my age, the men I'm talking about, not women, are bald. They lose their hair. <laughs> they have absolutely no hair whatsoever. And then other people have hair that is white. Now, I'm talking about men. Now, I do have white hair, but I have a lot of hairs. Now, I want to mention something that is quite interesting because this is biology. When a child is born, the mother of the child controls how much hair the baby will have in his or her life. Because it, we have something called gene, and gene, human genes, G-E-N-E, uh, -E, and then plural, S, genes basically transmit a lot of physical, notice the word physical, act, physical parts of the person. So the gene for hair on the head, notice the word, on the head, basically is controlled by the woman, by the mother. And I mention this because it's kind of funny. So I still have a lot of hair on my head, although it is no longer brown. It is uh, sort of white, but I still, if you look at Hey, look at me, I got a lot of hair on my head. Look at this. <laughs> now, yeah, some men, Excellent. some men basically, and this is one of the complaints of a lot of men, that is men now, males, when they get older, they start losing their hair. Now, there's an interesting point about my, my own family. So, my father and mother were married and if I remember right, my father was about 27 and my mother was about 24, the ages I'm giving. And I've seen the old pictures of them, old mean because they were married many, many decades ago. My father basically is bald, that's B-A-L-D, which means most of the hair on his head is gone is gone and he does not have a lot of hair on his head at age 27. Now on the other hand my mother in the her wedding picture has beautiful hair. So it was so beautiful that when she had the photographs of her wedding the uh, photographs are put in the window of the photographer's shop. You have a shop and in the window you put f photographs that the photographer wants to show to people. Well she had her picture in the window as being a very beautiful woman at age 23. But my father did not want his picture to be in the window. He did not want his picture to be in the window as the mother, excuse me, as the husband of this beautiful woman. So there was no picture of my father. So the picture I have of them is from the newspaper at that time 
At that time, you had newspapers called daily newspapers, the local community newspapers. And so the picture I have of my mother and father from their wedding was printed in the local newspaper. And that was common. You, would, you get married and then you have a picture. And there my father was there. And my father, most of his head was bald. And so he had some hair on the back, what you call the upper part here, just the back part and the front part, it was all bald, no hair. And I remember growing up that I was kind of worried about I, when I became older man, because he was 27 years old, that I was going to lose my hair and be a bald man. Well, I learned in school in a subject called biology. Biology basically is the science of living things as humans and plants. And I learned there basically about who controls the gene, the gene, the one gene for the length of the hair. And then when I found it out, I actually felt, wow, I'm very happy because I'm going to have my mother's hair. So my mother, even when she was an old woman, had much, much hair, much hair. And so I could stop worrying about losing my hair. And my brother was, I have one older brother, uh, roughly about two and a half years older. He had the same thing. He had all kinds of hair, all kinds of means, much hair. When he died, he died some years ago at age 69. And he had hair until he died. And he married a woman, that's my brother, married a woman who also had a lot of hair. So his children also have now still have a lot of hair, male and female. That's my brother has one son and three daughters. They all have hair, even my nephew. Nephew means my uncle's, it'd be my, well, the uncle's children. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and then be my background first before I talk about your mother a little bit because your mother is obviously going to probably die much later than me. And so I mentioned I was born an American citizen by birth. Now in the United States, according to U.S., it's called U.S. is short form for United States. In the U.S., when you are born on American soil or under American jurisdiction, and I explain that in a moment, but usually it refers to people born in the property, the country of the United States. If they are born in the United States, they are Amer excuse me, an American citizen by birth, by birth. So I was born an American citizen, same as my brother. And my father and mother were also born as American citizens. So we are an old style American citizen. And my mother and father, as I mentioned before, basically their families came from northern Germany. And I know that because we did some what you call geological research. And I actually, with your mother, actually visited the town the town, small, actually a town, a small city in northern Germany, where my grandmother, that means my father's, my father's mother was born. And I even have a photograph of the church where she would have been baptized in. And I went to the city hall in Germany. This is years ago when I was visiting Europe with my wife, your ancestor, hopefully. Well, hopefully you're more than that. She's still alive when you see this. We are visiting this town called Bentheim. That's B Bentheim. It's B E N D H E I M Bentheim, and it was called Bad Bentheim. That's B A D. Now, in the German language, now I mentioned this in case you ever want to, in the future, go back to see some of your 
Ancestro Homes. I mention it and then spell it. If sometime you go to Germany, it's in northern Germany, northern part of Germany, not too far from the border with the Netherlands. And the town is called Bad Bentheim, again B-A-D. And bad in the German language does not mean the same meaning as in English. Bad means not good. But in the German language, it means bath. In English, it's B-A-T-H. And so it is a small town. Bad Bentheim is a small town that has a lot of uh, what you call baths, B-A-T. That means people come there and then they pay money and then they take, take baths. And it's just a small town. And it's in the province of Bentheim, which is a province. It means a larger area of Germany. And so that's where they came. And your mother and I actually visited. And as I mentioned, started, we went to the city hall. I saw a birth certificate of my father's mother. That's my father's mother. And it was a, a birth certificate means it is the government, the German government uh, official document of her birth. And so she was born there, that being my, what we call paternal, paternal means from father's family, paternal grandmother, that's my maternal grandmother, was born there. Now, and I still have a record of it, I have a piece of paper somewhere, official document to show that my father's mother was born in Germany. Now, referring to my father's mother, he also was born in Germany, but we have, you know, a document or something, and I don't remember much where he was born, but he was definitely born in Germany. So we are what we call German ethnic group. Ethnic group is, means you go back in history to find out where the people were born and where they lived. So both my father and mother, excuse me, both of my father's family were born there. Now going over to my mother's family, my mother's family was also born in Germany because a relative of hers some years ago had actually done research and printed a pamphlet, which means a group of small papers together, it's like a book, small book, had done research on my mother's family, that means my mother's family, and they also had been born in Germany, but I don't remember exactly where, probably northern Germany. Because northern Germany was basically Protestant people in religion, whereas southern Germany was very much Catholic, so you had a division in Germany between Protestants in the north and then Catholics in the south. Now, the reason I mention that is just just west of Germany, you have the Netherlands, which is opposite the northern Germany, and opposite southern Germany is Belgium. And Belgium is Catholic, and Netherlands is primarily, means mainly, Protestant. So at one time, Belgium was part of the Netherlands. And the Netherlands had been under Spain, the country of Spain. And you have basically the Netherlands then eventually became independent against Spain. Now that's all history now. And then it divided into Belgium, which is basically Catholic, and the Netherlands, which is mainly, mainly, mainly Protestant, although you are, you have Dutch Catholics there. Now notice again, we're talking about history. So people are sort of concerned, most people are concerned about family matters and are concerned about where did their family come from and what you call family history. And so what I'm giving you now, the people that are watching this, I'm giving you the Harmson family history and later your mother can talk about her Park family history, but that's that is a different section, not mine. I'm talking about mine. 
So that is the importance of history. You find out where you're from. Now, I mentioned any American, any person born in America on American soil is considered America. So your mother was born in Korea to Korean parents, and she's considered Korean because that is a normal procedure. You're born in a country, generally, and you follow the laws, and most countries have laws that say if you're born in a country, you're a citizen of that country by birth. So that's sort of the background. So going back to me now, I was born in Michigan in the United States in 1944 during World War II. And I was born to American citizens, mother and father, had been born in the United States. And so I was born in a hospital called a Hospital in Muskegon, that is the city, and about maybe, what, an hour drive by automobile from Grand Rapids, Michigan. So it's called the whole Grand Rapids area. And Grand Rapids, that's G-R-A-N-D, one word, and then Rapids, R-A-P-I-D-S, Rapids. Grand Rapids is the number two city in Michigan. So number one city is Detroit, that's farther in the southeast, and number two is Grand Rapids. And so uh, my father eventually later worked a long time in Grand Rapids City. So I was born in Muskegon, and I lived in Muskegon for about three and a half years, as I remember. Obviously, I don't remember, but people, my mother and father told me, so I remembered my history told to me, my mother and father, about three and a half years, and we lived in a place called Muskegon Heights. Now that means a, a part of Muskegon. Muskegon actually is a large city on the west coast of Michigan. And then the, the lake there is called Lake Michigan. And some years ago, many years ago, I actually drove in Muskegon Heights by the hospital where I was born and the hospital was still there and I'm pretty sure it's still there now. And I drove down the street where the, I saw the, ho the house that I lived in for about three and a half years. Now, obviously, at that young age, I don't remember anything. But my parents had told me where I was and they gave me the address, and the house was still there. And I don't know if the house is still there. Because years ago, years ago, when they built houses, and it was a house made of wood, not brick, when houses are were built years ago, and probably it was over a hundred years. So the houses, even the houses made of wood, would last a long time. So it, I don't know if it's still there. And if you're interested, you can drive and try to find it. And I'll have the information later about the address. It's on a street with a street number, and I saw the house. So I lived in the house for three and a half years, and then my parents moved to a village, a village which is south, a little bit south, technically about southwest of the Grand Rapids area. Grand Rapids is a large, I said, large, large city. And they moved to, I got that wrong, I think. No. Ah, Lamont was in the northwest. I confused it. Lamont, that's L-A-M-O-N-T. Lamont was a which a small village northwest of Grand Rapids, a little bit, and not far out. You could drive from Lamont into Grand Rapids easy in about 20 minutes or something. And so they moved, my parents, mother and father, moved from Muskegon to Lamont. And the reason they moved to Lamont is my father wanted to go back to where the area where he was born. So my father's name is Howard, that's H-O-W-A-R-D, Harmson. And my middle name, I'm Bruce Howard Harmson. So I was named for my two grandfathers with B, Bert and Ben, and I was named for my father, Howard. And then the short verb of Howard is Howie. 
So growing up, I was called Howie. It's H-O-W-E-I-E. Because I did not particularly like the name Bruce. So I was called Howie. Because I preferred Howie over Bruce. Notice this is what I liked. And that's why I was called Howie, short for Howard. So my father moved to Lamont. And it was just a small village. And the whole area there was farmland. And as I said, it was not too far from Grand Rapids. Now, the interesting point about the state of Michigan, which is a large state, a large state, is you have a lot of farmland. And it's and Michigan has some very large cities, Michigan, the state, some very large cities in it. And then you have a lot of farmland with a lot of farms. And it's what you call urban, that means city area, and then you have a lot of farmland called rural, R-U-R-A-L. And much of Michigan is a rural area. Now the interesting point about the state of Michigan is you have in the west of Michigan, you have Lake Michigan, and in the north of it you have Lake, got to think a minute, Lake Huron, and then east of Michigan you have Lake Erie and Lake Huron. Now, that whole area of the United States is called the Great Lakes, the whole area. And Michigan is sort of the center of that area because you have five, five, one, two, three, four, five Great Lakes there. And so if you look at a map of Michigan, and it's interesting to look at maps. You have maps in the United States and all the various parts. And so Michigan is part of the Midwest, and it's part of the Great Lakes. That's five of them, five lakes there. Now, the interesting point about Michigan is Michigan itself is divided into two different areas. You have the Lower Peninsula, Lower Peninsula, and you might look at your dictionary and see what a peninsula is. Peninsula basically means it comes up, and you have three parts of it. And the three parts of the lake of the state are surrounded uh, adjoining lakes. Michigan has three parts of it that belong to lakes, and in the southern part is land. Go, uh, judging is basically meeting two states called Illinois and Ohio. Now you have to look at maps to see that. So Michigan is a very strange state because it's divided in two parts. It has the lower peninsula and the upper peninsula. And that's unusual in the United States. And then you have peninsula, which means you have water, water, and we call them lakes. You have Lake Michigan there is divided. Michigan into the upper peninsula and the lower peninsula. So then the question is how, if you're driving an automobile, which you do because there are many roads everywhere in America, many roads, and you have automobile also called cars, C-A-R, how do you get from one peninsula to another? Well, there's another word you should know. It's called a bridge. You have, look at my hands, you have here one and two, and then you have a connection there over the water. This is water. And it's basically a bridge is built, is built out of steel. Originally, a long time ago, the bridges were wo by wood, but now they're by steel. And you have the two parts and you have a bridge joining them. But years ago, years ago before the bridge was built, you had something called a ferry, F-E-R-R-Y. And a ferry basically means a boat or a ship connecting two places on water. So originally it was a ferry connected and then the bridge was built. And so the first time I went from Lower Peninsula to Upper Peninsula, I was about four or five years old, four or five years old, and there was no bridge and we had to go across by ferry. Of course, I don't remember it because I was about five years old. So that is Michigan right there. And so much of Michigan, oh, the Upper Peninsula is, you have a, a few cities, 
a few cities and you have some universities there and you have some industries but much of the much of it is farmland now the interesting point of upper michigan is during the winter because it's in the midwest and just north of michigan is canada the whole point of canada is it goes toward the north pole canada is very very large very very large country upper canada is very very cold with much snow and even coming down so michigan even lower peninsula you have four seasons you have spring summer yeah spring summer fall and winter so in the fall also called autumn a-u-t-u-m-a -A, that's when it starts getting cold and i lived in lower peninsula not too far from the southern border you had a lot of snow and i mean a lot of snow <laughs> so when i was a young boy i would have snow and the snow would be up to my knees my knees as a young boy and so you had four seasons and that mean that basically means even nowadays you have a lot of snow even in lower michigan because the top part of the united states all the way across from pacific ocean to the atlantic ocean the upper part a lot of snow a lot of snow in winter and so we had four seasons and so I remember growing up and struggling and walking through the snow and sometimes I would be in a snow drift or something, the snow would be drifting and the snow would be up to just below my neck because the snow would drift on drift and drift and I'd walk in the drift and we would make what you called snowmen. Snowmen we, we take, we just by making a snow statue, uh, a snow statue, and we call it a snowman. We just spend time making snowmen. But the point was you had four seasons. And much of the northern part of the United States, all across the United States, northern part you got snow. And out in the western part of the United States, in the mountains, you have views of mountains. Now Michigan did not really have mountains. No, there were some hills in Upper Peninsula. Hills. Hills. Look at my hand there. You can probably see my hand. This is the land and this is the hill. This is a mountain. So western, we're talking about northern Michigan, had low hills. One area, only one area, had low hills. No mountains in Michigan. Most of the land was very flat. With just one area in Upper Peninsula, there were hills. And I actually drove up and one time, that was some years ago, I drove up and that was before I met your mother. And so I drove up into the mountains to say I've been in the hills of Michigan because most of Michigan was flat. And much of uh, the f area in the middle section of the U.S. is all flat, <coughs> flat land. Now what that means is you have a lot of soil, that means dirt, that is just there. And that is the importance of the United States, of the United States. The central part, you have the eastern part, the central part, and the western part, and then the northern part, and then the southern part. But much of the United States is midland, which means flat area. If you're over by New York City in that area, a little bit north of New York City, you have some hills in that. But in Michigan, it was basically flat. Now, is that good or bad to have flat land? Now we're talking about history now, just more than history. That was extremely important because from the area about uh, Wisconsin, uh, um, uh, Western New York State, all the way over to the Rocky Mountains, Rocky Mountains are over in an area called Wyoming, and particularly Colorado. The mountains are the very, very high area. Very, very high. And you have all that flat land. So why is that important in the United States? We're talking about the importance of the country, the United States now, which is now 50 states, 5-0.
So why is that so important? Well, it's important for one reason. And you must remember this word. This word is extremely important in human life. It's only four letters. So remember that. It's F-O-O-D. I repeat, F-O-O-D. Now, what does that mean? You should know what, for, what food is. Food basically means that stuff you eat, stuff you eat that allow you to live. If you don't have food, you die. Because food, you have all kinds of food, many kinds of food. But basically, you look at your, this is another word, body. This is your body. And your body needs food, basically, to give it fuel so that you can you can grow and develop and look at I move my hands around and stuff like that. If you live in an area where there is no food, it's called a desert. That means, well, you could even have a little bit of hills in the desert, but it means a place where you cannot grow food. You can't grow food in a desert, except in one area called an oasis, which means a small area where you have some water. So notice I'm using another word there. You need water. So you have the, the flat land and you must have water. You must have water. And then you have another word which is important. The food is what you'll call crops. C-R-O-P-S. Crops means, the another word is grain, but crops means the stuff that the plants, crops, is plants that you grow in the food, excuse me, to grow food in the land. And the land is called dirt. You have dirt. Now, dirt is good, D-I-R-T, because it is a place that has a lot of stuff that will allow plants to grow. Plants to grow. And so, my father moved from Muskegon, where he had a job in a company. My father worked in a company in an office. He was an office worker. And then he wanted to move back to Lamont. That's L-A-M-O-N-T, Lamont. Young Sook, you, you taping? Are you taping? Yes. Okay. Go So my father moved to Lamont. And the reason my father moved to Lamont is my father grew up on a farm. That's F-A-R-M, on a farm. A farm basically means the people are growing food on land. And they grow food and then they sell the food and they eat the food and people eat the food. So farms are very important. So the center area of the United States, the center area is called farmland. Farmland, I talked about from the mountains over all the way over to New York. And Michigan, most of Michigan, most of Michigan is farmland, which means you have dirt, which is good soil, good soil, dirt to grow crops so people can eat the food and they sell the food. And that is why it's very important. And then you have a word farmer. The farmer is the person that has a farm and he has, he, he has basically several ways to make his farm work. Number one is growing crops, crops. And then number two, you have what you you call a dairy farm. That's D-A-I-R-Y. That means you have cows. Cows. That's C-O-W-S. You have cows there. So cows are important. So you have either a crop farm or a dairy farm or you have a combination. Combination, which means both. So my father grew up on a, basically, a food farm. A, no, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. 
He grew up on a dairy farm, which means there were cows. And cows give something called milk, M-I-L-K. And you should know what milk is by now. You drink milk, and milk has a lot of nutrients, things that are good for you. So my father wanted to move back to the area where he grew up on the farm. And my father's family, that means my father's mother and father, and my father had three, got to think a minute, he had three brothers and two sisters. So it was a farm family of five children. Now the interesting point about my father's farm family, you had one, two, three, four, and five. My father was the youngest child. He was number five of the farm family. And so they lived in a big house and they had a dairy farm. And the dairy farm was called 90 Acre Dairy Farm. Now at time, at nine zero is 90. A 90 acre dairy farm was a good, good size, not great, but a good size farm. It was a dairy farm. Now there's one problem with a dairy farm. One big problem. You have cows, that's C-O-W-S. Cows have to be milked both in the morning and at night. It means early morning and then at night. That means you must get up early in the morning, go out to the barn. The barn is the place where the cows live. You have a house and in the barn, the barn is for the cows. And also you got pigs and chickens and other stuff there. But you got to get up early in the morning sometimes before sunrise to milk the cows and then let the cows out and the cows go out and they eat the grass. They eat the grass and then they produce milk and then you got to bring them back at night you got to milk them again. Now there's a question here. Is the farmer's life on a farm that is a dairy farm, is it easy or difficult? Oh, it is very difficult. Like I said, you got to get up early, early, and then you do it later at night, which is not too bad. You got to get up early and milk the cows. If you don't milk the cows, they don't give you the milk, and then you don't take the milk, and you can't save the milk. You cannot sell the milk, and then you don't have any money. Now, money is important because if you want to leave, you got to have something that makes money. So a 90 degree, 90 acre, acre is an area, it means how the land is divided. A 90 acre farm is actually quite good. So if they did not have the cows, they could not make money and they would have to leave and go and do something else. So my grandfather had the farm there. And he, my grandfather also, that's my father's father, also worked in a uh, in a uh, factory. So my father's father, my grandfather actually had two jobs. Well, he had three sons and as the sons were growing up, the sons would then take care of the farm. And my father used to complain about it, having to get up at five o'clock in the morning when there's no sun, there's no sun up and you gotta get up at five. And, and then my father, my father's father would actually go and work in a factory to make money. So you had two things. So my father's grandfather was very, very smart. Very smart with machines. That I'm talking about, his name was Benjamin now, Ben. He was very, very smart man. And he was very good at machines. So it was a company that had machines to do different. I don't even remember what it was anymore. So they did something else on the farm. Now the farm, I mentioned there were two things. One is a crop farm and the, then dairy farm and there's another one about the crop. Well, there's two kinds of crops. There are crops that grow all on the, on, you have the soil here, dirt, and then you have it grow up there. Now there's a second kind that grow, here is the, here's the dirt, this is all dirt, that grow down. And one of those crops was called carrots. 
And if your mother and father will you know, eat carrots, a long yellow orange colored thing, and they grow in the ground. So on the top of them, you have what you call the top part and the leaves, and then they're growing in the ground. So what you have to do is you have to dig them out and pull them out. So my grandfather's farm also raised carrots. But there's one problem with carrots. It grows in the dirt, and sometimes you pull it out, and sometimes they're this long. They're like this. They're this long. Sometimes they are all rotten. That means bugs have got into them, insects have got in. You cannot eat them, and they're useless. And that's the problem of having a a a, a ground a ground farm. So if you have grain farm, is in America wheat is a very good point. If you re, if you eat your bread, American bread is made out of wheat, and it grows above the ground, and sometimes it's very tall, and it's a long, thin, and crawl, and they have grains and stuff like that. But if you go, if you have a carrot farm, some days there's nothing. It's all rotten. You cannot eat the carrots. And my father used to talk about some. They had good, good years and bad years. Some years, all the carrots were no good. But notice what I said. My grandfather had a job in a factory. He was a very smart man with a machine. Then he had a 90-acre dairy farm. Dairy, D-A-I-R-Y. That means cows. For milk, he was milk. And then he also grew some crops. It was mainly carrots. And sometimes carrots are no good. Now the simple point is there. You don't want to depend only on one thing. But if one thing doesn't work, what do you do? Well, number one, you if you don't have any money, scatter, uh, that you have a lot of money saved, you can't buy food, you don't buy food, you die. So why do people work? People work because they need money for everything, especially food. And so you have a lot of farmers, and the farmers often will mix a lot of stuff. They'll have their main idea, like dairy farm, was my grandfather's main idea, dairy farm for milk, and he'd sell the milk, and people would buy the milk. But he also had the carrot, carrots in the ground, and sometimes it didn't work. But then the number three, my grandfather had a job working in a factory with machines. He was an, an expert on machines. So in the factory, he didn't see, he was responsible for maintaining the, the machines in the factory that did something. Now, I don't even remember what kind of, what kind of factory it was, but my fa grandfather was a very, very smart man. So he had three things going. So notice what I just said. You don't want to have just one thing or two things. Three is better. Three is probably best. You don't want to have four, five, ten because too difficult. So because my my grandfather had three boys, three boys, they had to work on the farm. Now there's an interesting thing about that farm. They worked on a farm. They lived in a big house. It was a big house. You had seven people there, mother, father, five children, big house. You had uh, three boys and two girls. And so it was a big house, but you had to work. The key word here is work, W-O-R-K. You had to work, particularly on a farm. So what happened with my, my father was the youngest of three children, youngest. And so when the oldest boy got to be something about 18 years old, roughly 18 years old, that's when you graduate from high school. Then he would find a job. So we were we were only about at that farm was only about twenty minutes, twenty minutes by automobile, from the city, big city. So he got a job in the city. So that meant then my father and his older brother had to do the farm work. Notice what I just had had to do the farm work. And so then eventually the second son left and so my father was there and 
then my father had to do a lot of the work. Continue. Finish? Continue. And so what you had is this was the normal society in America at that time. My father was born in the year 1914. That's 1914. Now that also was the time period of the First World War, which was fought in Europe, which is from 1914 to 1917. That's when Britain was fighting against Germany, mainly. And so that was in Europe now. And so my father was born in 1914. My mother was born in 1917. So my father basically lived on the farm and he went to the uh, local. Now I got to understand it was all farmland. It was small village. You have some small houses there and you had a grocery store and you had a uh, place to get gasoline and not much was there. It was a farm area. And then my father would go to, they had a school, which was a prime primary school, which was a three room school for eight grades, kindergarten, first and second grade, and then, then three more grades. Then after eighth grade, it was what you called middle school at that time, you would go to high school, which was grades nine, 10, and 12. And then each one was one year long. Then at and roughly 17 or 18, you would graduate from high school. So there's a question now. So the village was surrounded by farms all around. All around was farms. And we lived on a hill. Well, later, uh, later, forget that at the moment. And so my father had to drive an automobile, a car at age, age, I think it was 14. You could drive, well, you could drive a, a, an automobile, a car from the farm, from the farm to the, uh, there was a, a town, a town not too far away. Oh, maybe about 20 minutes away, the opposite way from Grand Rapids. And this is where the high school was. It was called Coopersville. Coopersville was the name of the town. I think it was maybe about three or 4,000 people. Three or 4,000 people. That was the high school. So my father on the farm, if he wanted to go to high school, somebody had to drive the car. It was about what, five miles, maybe five miles, five miles. Because now this is the important point. At that time, there were no school buses. No school buses come to pick you up. You, you go outside your house, you stand by the road, and the school bus comes. And the color of the school bus in America is still eight, excuse me, is still yellow. It's yellow color. It's a school bus. And the reason it's yellow, for one reason, you got a lot of other cars that's called private cars, but owned by people and trucks and commercial businesses. And you got a yellow color for one reason, simple. So you don't want other cars to drive into the bus full of young kids. Because then you can kill the kids. So the buses are always yellow. So if you're far away and you're in a traffic, you have a lot of cars and you're back, you can see the bus far ahead of you because it is a big bus and it's a tall, the, much taller than the car much taller than a car. You can see it. And the idea is you don't hit the bus because then you hurt or kill kids. And it happens occasionally because people are stupid. And so there were no school buses. None whatsoever. You want to go to high school? And that's ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. And then you graduate and become adult at age 17 or 18. So my father had to use the car, the family car to drive five days a week in the morning. And the school was roughly about 8 a.m., 8 a.m. to about 3 p.m., 3 to 3 a.m. And he had to drive, either he or his brother, 
his brothers. When his brothers were older, they drove. And then when he got to be 14, and he was younger and they were gone, two brothers were gone. So my father at age 14, if I remember right, he'd have to drive the automobile. Now, generally speaking, in the U.S. right now, nowadays in the United States, you got to be 16 years old. 16, not 14. Now, when you're in, now this is the difference in the United States. If you're in farmland in the United States, farmland, that means the kids live on the farm and they go to whatever the nearest farm, uh, the school is. Sometimes they have to drive a long distance because if people have big farms or out in the West ranches, it's a long drive. So then in those states, Michigan is a state, there's 50 states in the United States. In those states, you can drive an automobile at age 14. Why 14? Because the high school starts at 14 and there are no buses out in the ranches and that is farmland and there's ranch land. Ranch land means a lot of horses and cattle. That means they don't send the school bus there because the kids live too far away from the school. So they have to drive a car or a truck. Truck is a little bit similar. So in those states, you can drive a car at 14 and 15 because there's no other way to get to the school. You gotta drive the car to the school and then drive back. So my father had to go get from the farm to the school, which is about five miles away in a small town, about 3,000 people, high school, four years. He had to drive, he had to drive the car because his brothers, I think, were gone. They had graduated. And so notice what I just said. You have to look at the circumstances. That's another word for you. Circumstances mean situation you're in. And then the government means the local government, that city and town. And then uh, the uh, provincial one or state there means farms and ranches. They got rules to change to allow people to do it. So my father spent four years at Coopersville High School and he graduated at age 18 because it was 14, 15, 16, 17. At age 18, you are graduated from the high school and you can get a job. So he was born in 1914. Eight years later, it's 1932. Night and one nine three two. This is important now for American history. Notice the word again: history. History is what happens and over time and what changes. Well, in the whole United States, in the year nineteen twenty nine one nine two nine, there was a Great Depression. That means all the money has lost its value, and companies go broke and people can't find jobs. Okay, we can <clears throat> start uh, with the Great Depression, okay? We cut here and then start the game. Okay. okay.